Welcome to you all. This is Frank Gaffney. I'm the executive chairman of the Center for Security Policy and the vice chairman of the Committee on the Present Danger China. I want to say at the outset, um, our apologies for technical difficulties that have made this a little bit more challenging than we had anticipated. Um, we have one of our featured guests um, both on audio and video, and we have one of our featured guests by audio only. So we're going to just make do. And um, again, apologies to everyone who has been kept waiting as we tried to sort this out. We're here to talk about a very important topic um, with some breaking news about it that I think will make this uh, very much uh, worth the wait, um, as will our featured guests. Um, we're going to be talking about um, the president's decision this week with respect to the thrift savings plan, the federal government's um, retirement system for both its military personnel, those currently serving and veterans, as well as the uh, civilian employees of the United States government past and present. This is important in its own right for reasons that we will be discussing. It's, uh, I think, also the case, though, that it is important as a microcosm of a much larger problem that we're going to be talking about. And we're hoping that we'll be able to start addressing uh, with your help in the days ahead. Um, I'm going to introduce our two presenters. We're really going to do this as a conversation rather than formal presentations. Um, they're both extraordinary men. I've had the privilege of knowing both of them for a long time and having uh, the even greater privilege of having worked with them uh, for many years as well. I, I really can't think of two people that I hold um, in higher esteem and whose contributions to this particular matter, as well as to our national security more broadly, um, really cannot be exaggerated. They've been incredible patriots and servants uh, of our republic. Um, the first is uh, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, William Jerry Boykin. You're not seeing him, but you will be hearing from him. Uh, General Boykin is a distinguished uh, veteran of the United States Army. In fact, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say he is one of the most storied, certainly contemporary uh, military officers uh, in American military history. Uh, he has uh, been engaged in virtually every um, important conflict and military operation of our time. He has been uh, a leader in as well as a member of the most elite units of our special forces. He has also worked closely with the intelligence community, uh, both at the Central Intelligence Agency in the field and uh, at headquarters. And he has served as uh, most recently the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence in the George W. Bush administration. These days, he's the executive Vice President of the Family Research Council. General Boykin, among his many other attributes, is an ordained minister. And I know his faith has uh, brought him to this present topic, among other things, as well as his deep understanding of the nature of the threat we're facing from the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, General Boykin, welcome to you, sir. And I'm so sorry about the technical difficulties that have uh, made this voice only, but we're very pleased to have you with us. Uh, next up, we're going to speak uh, and uh, welcome uh, another extraordinary uh, patriot and friend, Roger W. Robinson, Jr. Uh, Roger has been active in public policy matters uh, well even before he joined the Reagan administration. Uh, he was uh, a vice president for the Chase Manhattan Bank and a special assistant to its chairman, David Rockefeller. For a number of years before he joined the National Security Council under President Reagan and then National Security Advisor Judge William P. Clark. And in the latter role, he uh, served as the Senior Director for International Economic Affairs, drawing upon his experiences in the private sector to help the Reagan team uh, 
conceptualize and then execute the strategy that President Reagan used to take down the Soviet Union, the last totalitarian communist regime that sought the destruction of this country. He did that um, with uh, tremendous creativity and effectiveness, and I think we'll probably hear a little bit about how the United States used its uh, economic warfare skills and capabilities to accomplish great things, something that is really very much relevant to where we are today with another totalitarian communist um, party and, and regime that seeks, again, the destruction of this country, namely the Chinese Communist Party. Um, Roger Robinson these days is the president of RWR Advisory Group, LLC. He is also the founder and chairman of the Prague Security Studies Institute. I think it's in that capacity that he'll be joining us today. He has also served as both the chairman and vice chairman of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, an incredibly important uh, independent uh, sort of uh, sanity checker on the U.S. government's assessments of what's going on in communist China and what it means for all of us. In other words, these are two extraordinarily highly credentialed, highly skilled, and um, enormously valuable colleagues. Um, mm -hmm. Both uh, have been helpful to uh, General Boykin as a member, Roger Robinson as a uh, sort of of counsel to the Committee on the Present Danger China, a project of the Center for Security Policy. And we're very pleased to have them here to talk about this uh, incredibly important week in our nation's history and uh, where we go from here. Uh, gentlemen, again, thank you and welcome to you both. Um, General, I think I might start with you, uh, and then Roger, I invite you to chime in. Um, we need to set the stage, I think, a little bit about uh, where we are. And forgive me, there's a bit of background noise here. If you're hearing it, they're uh, repairing a house that I'm uh, moving into shortly. Um, the question is, what kind of threat does the Chinese Communist Party represent? Uh, General, you've uh, dealt with a lot of threats, both uh, as an intelligence uh, expert and as a you know, old-fashioned military warrior. Um, how would you characterize the Chinese Communist Party in the spectrum of uh, challenges that we've faced in the past and um, that we are likely to face even more so in the future? <clears throat> Very simply, existential. They are an existential threat to America. When I was at the CIA as a brand new Brigadier General in 1995 and 1996, China was, uh, I think, just coming on the radar in terms of it being a significant threat. You know, it had always been there. Um, and we were watching very closely uh, the, the the technology that China was developing, which, you know, we finally admitted was mostly coming from America. Uh, and then in uh, 2003, when I went back into intelligence, uh, as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, I was uh, surprised, I might say shocked, at how rapidly they had moved in that period of time from 96 to 2003. Uh, and, and things like cyber and things like outer space. I mean, they're, the fact that by that time they could shoot down satellites and that type of thing. So it, it was incredible. But then I had a sit down with some of the analysts and, and, and it became very, very clear that what had, a, what had aided China, what had enabled China was our technology and our stupidity, if I may be so bold as to say that. And the reality was that we knew what they were doing and we, we were doing nothing about it. And then on top of that, we gave them a, a, a special trade status going all the way back to the end of World War II. And, and that was to help rebuild China. <clears throat> and, uh, and we never changed that. We never changed it. So what they were doing was they were, they were taking our money, not only buying our debt, but they were the, the trade balance was so skewed 
that we were literally building China's military as well as China's technology uh, with our money. And in fact, if the president hadn't made the decision the other day, a bold decision, a decision that was not supported by his advisors to cancel this investment by our, our, our thrift savings plan dollars, uh, which would have gone into, uh, once again, the existential threat aspects of China. Um, I, I'm telling you, it, we would be in an even worse situation than we actually are right now. China's an existential threat, and we have got to wake up and realize that we've got to stand up to them right now and stop doing these foolish things that we've been doing for so long. Uh, and regardless of, of what you say, this president has had the uh, courage, but also the foresight to see what China is and to take action to stop them. Thanks. That's a great overview, General. What, one of the things I thought you were going to say is uh, if he hadn't stopped it, uh, they'd be using your money <laughs> to do some of this. Yeah. And I, that brings me to uh, Roger. Um, of course, you have been tracking enemies of this country and in particular uh, evaluating their um, economic uh, warfare uh, against us and, and the means by which they um, make it happen, um, both the economic and, and for that matter, preparations for other kinds of threats of the sort that uh, General Boykin just talked about. Um, give us a flavor of the degree to which it's not just our technology, it's not just our trade, trade imbalances, um, it, it's not just uh, the, the witting uh, assistance that many in American businesses have provided in migrating um, our productive capacity to China that has enabled them to become such a formidable threat. Uh, talk about the role that uh, uh, the capital markets of the United States, Wall Street, if you will, have been playing in that regard. Well, Frank, I think that uh, <clears throat> the money, put simply, has been the single most overlooked dimension of the threat posed by China to the United States. We, we hear a lot, as you mentioned, about trade flows. We hear a lot about the dual-use technology, the theft thereof. Uh, we are constantly uh, hearing about their, te their uh, intellectual property theft, uh, their hacking, their cyber attacks, and, and too much else to name. Their espionage, including in universities of the United States. Uh, and we are in a constant, we're seeing a constant array of <clears throat> aspects of the threat. But for the better part of 20 years, nobody ever talked about the capital markets. Now, the Chinese don't have a convertible currency, just as the Soviet Union did not. The yuan, or RMB, is not an exchangeable currency in the world. You can choose to trade in it if you wish, as China tries to do with a number of its bilateral partners. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> it's not the dollar, it's not the yen, it's not the euro. They need a means of exchange. Their voracious appetite for dollars knows no bounds. Obviously, we're the reserve currency of the world, and they have come to our markets in a steady line of state-owned enterprises, state-controlled enterprises, for what we now are estimating to be in the neighborhood, if you combine equity offerings, stock offerings, and bond offerings, uh, as much as $3 trillion or more have been raised uh, from the unwitting uh, portfolios, if you will, of 160 or so million American investors. I mean, this is the sad fact. Uh, I think that that number could be bigger. No one really knows, just as they don't know the number of Chinese companies in our markets. I mean, yes, we know that there's about 100 in the New York Stock Exchange, and there might be 75 in NASDAQ, and there's over 500 in the over-the-counter market because of its lax regulatory regime, you can be sure. But right now, we have index providers in the United States, and we're getting a little ahead of the story here, that are buying hundreds of Chinese companies 
right off of their domestic mainland exchanges in Shenzhen and Shanghai, simply adding them to a list called an index. They bring that back. Uh, it's turned into a fund, an index fund through an exchange traded fund, for example, and it's marketed to the American people. Uh, it avoids SEC regulations. It avoids federal securities laws. It certainly avoids any kind of material risk disclosure. And as a consequence, that number is ballooning. So no one really knows. But the, the, the long and short of it is that we have an amazing array of Chinese, what we could call bad actors, national security, human rights abusers, among that ever-growing list of Chinese companies in our markets. There's never been a screening mechanism. There's never been diligence performed. You know, we have CFIUS, for example, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, that helps monitor Chinese investment in the United States for national security reasons. We've never had such a screen up over the U.S. capital markets. We've never had the intelligence community engaged in trying to find out who these companies are and their networks of subsidiaries, a very important dimension. And as a consequence, and certainly the, the, the SEC hasn't regarded national security and human rights as a material risk element that requires disclosure. Fund managers, index providers, no diligence being performed there as to who these folks are. And so as a consequence, the Chinese have been emboldened to move more and more of these bad actors into our markets. And as the general mentioned, they were within days or weeks of being in the portfolios of the better part of 5.8 million federal employees and uniformed men and women of this country because it was seen to be an interesting expansion and diversification of assets by this rather opaque, obscure, Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board of five unelected bureaucrats that were making this kind of decision. So it was a very close call, but we have a much bigger problem than the, the, the thrift savings plan issue, as we affectionately call it. Hold we'll that thought, Roger. We're, I want to come back to that, needless to say. But before we do, um, General Boykin, I, I want to, among your many contributions to the national security, salute you as a signatory on two letters that uh, the Committee on the Present Danger China uh, facilitated. Uh, one, uh, a letter that went from you and 10 of your fellow influential veterans, uh, many quite prominent leaders, including uh, former Commandant of the Marine Corps, General James Jones, um, and uh, former National Security Advisor to President Reagan, John Poindexter, um, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, urging them to convey to the president the concerns that I, I think you and, and uh, your colleagues, but, but millions of uh, American uh, servicemen and women uh, serving and, and retired uh, obviously feel. And, and you also participated in another letter, I believe 134 uh, prominent individuals, including several of those I just named, uh, directly to the president. I, there's no question in my mind that those letters contributed to the president's decision. But uh, one thing that in, I'd just like you to expand upon a little bit, if you can, General, is uh, the kinds of bad actors that Roger Robinson is talking about, that uh, these uh, funds would have been invested, your retirement dollars would have been invested in. Uh, can you give us a sense of, you know, the at least the kind of work that they were doing, if not the names of the companies themselves? Yeah, I'd just stop and think about uh, the fact that in 1999, two Chinese colonels wrote a treatise called uh, Unrestricted Warfare. Now, if you, if you don't believe that this is a real threat, you don't believe that uh, this problem is as serious and significant as we're saying it is, just go back and read that. And it'll tell you what they'd be doing with the money that we would be investing in China. It will tell you exactly what they're doing because they laid it out word for word. It's just like 
1958 when the Communist Party USA told us how they would take over America and we scoffed at them. We laughed. We said it'll never happen. And now all you have to do is go back and read that book, The Naked Communist. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that they've done exactly what they said they were going to do, or they're well on the way to accomplishing it. That's the same thing with unrestricted warfare. These two colonels are now much higher up in the chain, and they wrote this in 1999, and they're still in the military. They're still pulling the strings. They're still there. So they told us that they were going to they were going to conduct cyber warfare against us. That they would uh, attack us in outer space. That uh, they even and you can make the case they even talked about. Uh, you know, the use of something like a pandemic or chemical warfare, or biological warfare, or something like that. And all of those things uh, are what we can expect from the money that we're transferring to them, that we've been transferring to them. But had we put another, what, what was it, about $800 billion that the thrift savings plan represented? I think that's what Total. it was. Right. Put another almost a trillion dollars. How would that have enhanced the pace of these things that these two colonels told us they were going to do? How would that kind of money, that influx of money, have increased the pace of what they consider to be their takeover of not just America, but I mean really the whole world? Their their goal is is global domination. And that this this whole idea of the string of pearls and the Belt and Road and what is it, China 2025, I think it is, or 2021 or something. All of this is geared towards achieving their goal of global domination. And, uh, and, and that money that we were about to put in there was only going to help them to achieve that objective. Yeah. You know, I, I think it, the record should show that, you know, that's the total amount of money, some six or seven hundred billion dollars in the fund, only a portion of which would have actually gone to the Chinese. But your point is well taken, General. And, and interestingly enough, I think I'm right about um, the rough translation of the Chinese title for the book you refer to, Unrestricted Warfare, is a plan to destroy the United States. A little yeah. less uh, opaque. But Roger, I, I know your research at uh, the Prague Security Studies Institute mm -hmm. has helped, uh, you know, identify these uh, malevolent companies. Um, perhaps you can flesh out what the general was saying by giving us some specific examples. Well, first, let's talk about categories. We have U.S. sanctioned companies, companies that it's against the law for us to do business with, who are now being funded and invested in uh, by unwitting scores of millions of Americans. Let's start there. And they have all the prestige accorded them of being in the world's deepest and most voluminous markets, a kind of good housekeeping seal of approval that China uses around the world to access other capital markets because ours are so dominant. So this is a reward for China right there. On top of U.S. sanctioned entities, which is an, an outrage, <clears throat> you have proliferators of weaponry to Iran, North Korea, and other malevolent uh, countries around the world. You have, as I mentioned, intellectual property and technology thieves. You've got South China Sea island builders, those, those illegal islands in the South China Sea, and the militarization of those islands. These are the, these are done by companies and these companies have never been sanctioned, even though we object so strongly to their presence in the South China Sea. We named those companies in 2013, 2014, and they have not been, they have not been sanctioned. They haven't been even uh, penalized in any way. So you have human rights abusers. You have, let's get specific. You have hike vision that <clears throat> for example, manufactures the surveillance cameras that are every few meters atop the walls of the concentration camps in Xinjiang holding a million and a half Uyghurs or whatever number it ultimately is. You can see those camps from space. They're so vast. You ha have companies that are in the business of facial recognition technology of the type used at train stations in Tibet to pick up dissidents there. The surveillance state and how prevalent it is and how it's used 
to squash dissent and human rights. So it, this is not just a national security issue. You've got, again, known cyber attackers. You've got known companies that have engaged in espionage or their employees have. So these are just, and, and most importantly, you have PLA advanced weapons manufacturers, PLA contractors, AVIC, for example. They make the top line fighter aircraft, UAVs uh, for the Chinese. Uh, you have China yes, ships that makes, uh, that makes uh, ballistic missile submarines uh, on which uh, submarine launched ballistic missiles targeted the United States. They advertise 30 minutes flying time to our cities of the DF-41, for example. That's in the American people's portfolio. And that kind so, of- uh, let, let me just interject here. Um, the point is, and this is, I think, where you were going to go in a moment, but this is a sort of uh, example that is shocking uh, when you think about military men and women and other federal employees having their funds invested in these kinds of companies. But what you're saying is that uh, the president's decision to stop that, uh, laudable as it is, doesn't address the fact that millions, perhaps tens of millions of Americans who aren't investing through the thrift savings plan are having their funds place in companies like those you've mentioned doing the kinds of things that you and the general have talked about. So I, I want to come back again to the, the broader problem of the capital market, but i just like to give both of you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the specific decision here. Um, we've, we've heard that uh, there was opposition to the president taking the step that he did from within the administration. Heavens knows there was opposition from uh, their friends in Wall Street. Um, but Roger, maybe I could just ask you to sort of pick up the narrative here. Um, I, there's no, it's no exaggeration to say you were instrumental in identifying this as a problem in the first instance and helping the rest of us, uh, the Committee on the Present Danger of China, notably, to raise uh, an alarm about it. But um, how did this come to the president's attention in the final analysis? And, and what do you think prompted him to take the step that he did. Tell us a little bit about the step and uh, and uh, the the degree to which uh, he has set the stage for a broader effort along the lines of what we think needs to be done. Well, this is about a 10 and a half month tale of woe. I, um, I discovered that the thrift savings plan was going to be moving that $50 billion I fund over to the MSCI All Country World XUS Index, the one replete with Chinese and Russian bad actors back in July. Uh, I certainly shared that view with some of uh, some colleagues in the administration and the White House. Um, they were very uh, sympathetic to the scale of this problem and its, uh, its ironies and its uh, dangers. Uh, but it's not, it wasn't an easy um, path forward uh, because there are, like most administrations, and I'm certainly not singling this one out, it was true under President Reagan as well. Uh, there's a division of opinion, whether you're on the economic and financial side of the house, so to speak, if you think of the administration as a house, and then you have the more security-minded uh, agencies of government as well. Uh, and there is a dynamic between these two, because again, nobody wants to interrupt. If you're taking the economic argument for a moment of folks that were very reticent to see this step taken, what are they thinking? Well, let me give you some examples. They're thinking, we don't want to interrupt the, the, the free flow of global capital. We don't want to take actions that would estrange investors of the world from using our markets. Uh, and going elsewhere because we're setting up onerous restrictions and natty things like commanding disclosure, uh, this kind of thing. And it would be seen as damaging the competitiveness of our markets. There's the feeling that, oh, well, you're, you're politicizing uh, capital flows and portfolios and indexes. You're kind of a glorified, socially responsible investing type. You're, you're talking about fossil fuels and 
tobacco and guns and environmental degradation. Well, we're not. We're talking about fiduciary material risk, disclosure, transparency, good corporate governance, concern over share value, risk management, corporate reputation. This can all and has been all couched in market terms. So that this is not the ravings of ideologues. This is not some reflexive hand wringing, uh, uh, even though many of these companies are engaged in outrageous activities. You're not going to get very far with Wall Street and with the economic agencies of government with that kind of argument. So we try to stay anchored in the markets themselves. So as you can see, the push and pull here was uh, the president feels strongly about the performance of the Dow, the uh, <clears throat> Wall Street individuals that would intervene with the president were spooking him rather deliberately, suggesting that this is going to be terribly disruptive to the markets. It could hurt the Dow Jones uh, and this kind of thing. Uh, a specious arguments, in my view. And we were subordinating our fundamental values and our vital national security interests in the process. So to make a very long story short, we came up to a point in the end of April, beginning of May, where we're two weeks away from this taking place. It's, it, you know, th there were indications it would be wrapped up and this wrong-headed tragic decision reversed by the end of the year, latest, January came and went, February came and went. You had the feeling that the Wall Street supportive crowd was going to prevail. Yeah, the fix was in. Was had trusted interlocutors of his, in a sense, have to ride to the rescue because the, the TSP board, as I call it, the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board, was ex actually accelerating the effort to move the money so that they could claim that it's too disruptive, too costly to unwind such a transaction. It's a fait accompli. So that was where we were. And fortunately, that, that effort to remove the shield from the president and allow him to see this issue clearly for what it really is which is a national security human rights conundrum of the highest order, uh, prevailed. And of course, the president's instincts being what they are, as soon as this was starkly laid out, you see what he did. He not only came down with, uh, with a decision, but he came down with a more comprehensive decision than anyone would have imagined. You need to read those letters from National Security Advisor O'Brien, and Larry Kudlow, director of the National Economic Council, to Secretary Scalia, uh, the Secretary of Labor, who has some oversight responsibilities for the TSP board. And then also Secretary Scalia's to the chairman of the TSP board. Those are, in a sense, required readings because they yeah. define where we go from here. All right, that's a thought I want you to hold, Roger. And we want to get to a couple of questions from our audience if we can. But I, I did just want to invite General Boykin uh, to talk about this particular piece of the problem. Um, you've studied closely what the Chinese are about, General. You have worked against them and their agenda. Um, one of the things that has troubled me, and I know Roger, about what has been afoot here, um, certainly with respect to the thing we'll turn to momentarily now, the larger American investing community. Um, but prospectively, you know, your comrades in arms and, and uh, fellow employees of the federal government being essentially, well, induced by virtue of these investments of their, their financial fortunes in China to become effectively part of the China lobby. And, and Rogers just described that lobby at work uh, up until this very moment. And, and thanks be to God, you know, it didn't succeed. But just your, you know, from a, I guess, counterintelligence uh, yeah. assessment, General, uh, you know, give us a sense of how big a problem what the Chinese have done 
in this regard, among others, to get their hooks inside our society and exercise influence on our decision making. Well, to begin with, the, you know, the Chinese have infiltrated every entity within our society, either with citizens of China or with people that have they they paid that they bought off. But you know, we need to understand that the uh, no soldier, sailor, airman, marine, or coast guardsman uh, spends any time thinking about where their thrift savings plan is being invested, because they assume that the people that they are subordinate to, that being the administration, the commander in chief, and those who advise him, are going to do responsible things with their money. And that frees them up to be able to concentrate on fighting and winning wars. And don't ever forget that that's the only mission of our military, to fight and win wars. So they're not focused on that. Uh, it's not an issue for them because they assume that the right things are being done. But if you look at the fact that we have uh, uh, we have Chinese students that are sitting in our engineering classes at major universities, MIT, my alma mater, Virginia Tech, and learning about nuclear engineering and learning about things that they will go right back to China and transfer everything that they learned uh, back to, to China to enhance China's technology and their capabilities. And what are they doing on the side? What is the, how many of them are controlled by the Chinese embassy? We've caught spies before, haven't we? We've caught Chinese students and, and people that were in business, theoretically Chinese businessmen over here. Well, that's kind of what we do globally. You know, every country has their own little program, but the Chinese are overt and blatant about it. And we have turned a blind eye to it. And yes. that to me is a disgraceful thing. And I can't tell you why Roger, I'm sure Roger understands this so much better than I do in terms of why we've been reluctant to deal with this in a in a serious kind of way but uh, we have we've we've let them we've let them do these things and uh, and get away with it when it's now time for us to stand up and say no more no yeah. more it's done you're it's over with well and, and this is the point i think we've reached with uh, the thrift savings plan but roger just quickly on on those two points uh, you know how is it we've gotten to this juncture uh, in terms of uh, the compromise of so many Americans, uh, the companies and financial firms and the like, on the one hand, and, and the degree to which um, the Chinese can use their ability to control these financial resources invested in their country to influence um, individual citizens and, and uh, companies and organizations and, and indeed our government as a whole. I mean, to me, it almost smacks of a version of moral equivalency. I mean, we're assuming, and we have assumed as a society, a, an equivalency, that these are benign commercial entities that are coming to our markets, not that they're subject to Article 7 of the National Securities Law of China, for example, that allows the Communist Party to uh, operationalize them as intelligence officers on demand, or that they have Communist Party cells in every single enterprise management, senior management structures, for example. We're supposed to believe that these are benign commercial entities, just like our companies, and we behave this way. These are normal trading partners. We might as well be doing business with uh, anybody from uh, uh, UK to Argentina. Uh, we're not uh, unduly concerned about these folks. We have 370,000 Chinese students in our country. Guess what? Again, <clears throat> that these are uh, regular students that aren't reporting to anybody, that aren't using that, that, uh, those extraordinary skills that they're learning uh, for malevolent purposes. And the list goes on. And, it, and it, 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 it rolls right into the capital markets, 
where everybody's thinking fees, everybody, I mean, at least the Wall Street folks are thinking about these large fees uh, for going IPO for initial public offerings. A lot of money to be made when you bring a Chinese company to market. The Chinese know this. Again, it's part of the payola scheme uh, in part that uh, the general was referring to. And uh, you're also thinking about, well, I want to balance my portfolio with more of the world's second largest economy. It dominates the emerging markets. We all want emerging market exposure these days, supposedly. And uh, even though they've performed uh, rather, uh, rather miserably in some cases, but nevertheless. And so you have this view. I mean, let me ask you, uh, pose it this way. Uh, would we have had the same view toward the Soviet Union? Would there be, you know, hundreds of thousands of Soviet students? Would they have taken the Soviets been exposed to the tune of trillions of dollars in our capital markets? Would that have been OK? Uh, would they be seen as the benign trading partners uh, for the technology transfer at the most sophisticated levels that's happening today? Of course not. There wasn't one practically. And so this is this is the issue that we're facing. It's no longer a, a, a state secret that China is a malevolent force that is dedicated to the undoing of our institutions and everything we hold dear. Regrettably, that's the way this is going down. And the general's right. This is the time to stand up and look at the facts of the case, the empirical facts. They tell the story. And the reality is all of this is, of course, happening against the backdrop of the pandemic that the Chinese Communist Party has um, launched against us. Uh, the general pointed out unrestricted warfare talks about biological warfare as one of the, the threat vectors or attack uh, lines of attack that uh, can be used. Um, the American people, I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure this had some bearing on the president's decision as well, um, have indeed uh, become deeply not just skeptical, but I think alarmed about the Chinese and our relationship with them. So we've had this decision, this epic decision by the president to stop the investment of the thrift savings plan funds in Chinese companies. Um, the language that was used, as you said, Roger, in these two letters uh, from senior subordinates of the president expanded really the application of this principle that we don't want to be underwriting national security threats and human rights violating uh, activities of the Chinese Communist Party. What should we be doing now, Roger Robinson, to try to assure that uh, not just the folks like General Boykin, but those larger uh, pools of American investing uh, capital, um, the the universities, the trade unions, the you know uh, public pension funds and the like of states, notably, um, are are similarly protected against the kinds of uh, downside risks that both of you have talked about. Well, let's start by uh, stopping the averting of eyes. Uh, let's have the universities look at their investment portfolios. These are people that supposedly have a strong moral compass, uh, yet they're littered with uh, human rights abusers, for example. Can you get your hands on an investment portfolio to see the list of companies? Well, if you can, you're doing better than we are because uh, they're kept uh, very close hold. So the point is that every American needs to understand what Chinese entities are in their mutual funds, their index funds, their IRAs, their 401k programs. And guess what? When you ask your fund manager, your financial advisor to give you a list of such names, they're going to look at you with a blank stare because they have no idea. Uh, the indexes in, in particular, so-called passive investing, that's where most of the abuses are taking place. You know, you buy an index fund, you have no clue as to the thousand companies that might be in there. And I can tell you that's where they have secreted themselves. What about screening? Why can't we have the intelligence community and others in the government of the United States looking at this issue to find out who these folks are 
why can't we have the Securities and Exchange Commission really care about material risk disclosure, not just talk about it? Why can't we have uh, the same kind of requirements uh, of the Chinese companies that we have for our, their American corporate counterparts? The Chinese can avoid uh, public company uh, auditing oversight committee audits, PCAOB. They have the, these. This is designed by the government after the 2007-2009 financial crisis to supervise audits so that companies can't use their own sweetheart auditors and defraud the American people. Do the Chinese subject to PCAOB? No. Do the Chinese release their financials for scrutiny before some investors understand what's in the black box? No. Uh, are the Chinese compliant with federal securities laws in general? Uh, again, Sarbanes-Oxley, Dodd-Frank, answer no. How is it that the Securities and Exchange Commission is prepared to permit this kind of clear-cut preferential treatment for Chinese companies over our own? That's another place to start. What about those index providers and, uh, uh, you know, going to China to buy uh, hundreds of companies or to add hundreds of com companies that they that are uh, that are not vetted or any diligence performed so it's a it's a lengthy list frank and i know we don't have the time here to go through that list but i can tell you that it's issue after issue that is now before us we have an agenda we have the president's attention we have the commitment of the administration to do something about this we know what the list is Let's go do it. I couldn't agree more with you, Roger. Um, General, um, to you, this agenda that uh, Roger's talking about um, has an implication for one of the other priorities that I know you feel as strongly as I do, and that is to ensure that we are not enabling the oppression of the Chinese people and most especially um, faith communities in China. Um, Roger and you have both mentioned, I think, the Uyghur Muslims, uh, Christians, uh, whom there are said to be something on the order of 100 million, um, and Tibetans and Buddhists um, are among those that are also being horrifically oppressed by the Chinese Communist Party, uh, using among other things, uh, hike vision technologies. I think you referred, General, to the sort of social credit system. Um, talk, if you would, just, sir, a little bit about um, the implications if this kind of technology is not only used domestically to oppress the Chinese people, but is now available for export, accompanied by the 5G technology, the fifth generation wireless technology that they are, um, well, very advanced in, shall we say, if not dominant. In. Um, how do these affect not just people of faith, of course, but uh, but the, the cause of freedom around the world? And, and doesn't that add tremendously to the urgency that you both are talking about here? Yeah, it, I would say uh, last uh, week, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom put out its annual report. I would encourage all of your viewers, listeners to go to that report and see what it says about China and uh, what uh, what the Chinese are doing to the uh, the underground church, especially. But there is a there is a uh, sanctioned uh, Christian church which is heavily infiltrated by the uh, Gestapo, if you will, the Chinese Gestapo or their equivalent. And uh, so go to uh, the uh, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and read their report. And Frank, I'm going to have to break off. Uh, I've got another uh, event here at uh, right now, as a matter of fact. So well, I've been joined by you and Roger, and uh, you guys are just keep up the good fight, and God bless you. Thank you, sir, and thank you for your time. I know we're at the end of what we asked everybody to allocate, and Roger, I, I did have a couple of additional questions from the audience. If you have a few more minutes, and I might put them to you. Uh, General, thank you for your time and your service and your leadership. We're so grateful to you. Roger, are you good for a few more minutes? Yeah. Good. Um, 
Raj, there were questions um, about uh, some from hard experience, I have to say. Uh, another issue associated with investing in China, and that is if it turns out that the companies in which you are invested um, are frauds. Uh, there was one, uh, I think, that disclosed last year, if I'm not mistaken, a pharmaceutical company there that, uh, what was it, $4.4 billion had just gone missing. Um, one of our audience members has, uh, has struggled mightily for years trying to get some sort of compensation for uh, money that one of these fraudulent Chinese companies uh, essentially stole from him. Um, to what extent should the calculations about these investments be informed by the reality that, um, as you said, uh, these companies don't pass muster with the SEC's regulatory requirements or even our statutes, uh, accounting and otherwise. And if you actually wind up putting money, good money, into those companies, uh, you may lose your shirt. I mean, the Chinese stock market is not called a casino for nothing. And that's not that's not from detractors or anti-China individuals. That's a widespread perception, uh, even a, among market folks. The, the point is that you are in a no recourse situation. You don't have the rule of law. You don't have real arbitration. When you find out that a state-owned company is cooking the books like Luck and Coffee uh, more recently, and there are others that are in the pipeline that are going to be much more stunning than that, I'm told, uh, the American people just take the bath. And again, these companies are oftentimes buried in an index or something like that. Uh, the, invest, the individual American investor is probably not even aware of the hit that they're taking any more than they're aware of the companies that they're holding. So Wall Street counts on that, sadly. I mean, they're not sending you an email and say, we just took a bath on a fraudulent Chinese company that you were holding in your index and we're damn sorry about it and we'll do better next time. No, there's none of that. There's no accountability, even on our side. No. So in a sense, if this is don't ask, don't tell. I mean, I don't know if that's the appropriate uh, analogy, but this is the kind of odd situation we face. So uh, there is kind of a, a, a almost a code between Wall Street and Beijing, a, a, a code of silence, a code of normalcy, a code the, that all's well between the two largest economies, and we'll just kind of we'll just kind of finesse. Yeah, the thing that I, I think, as you sort of alluded to earlier, Roger, the thing that's so infuriating about this, <clears throat> excuse me, is the investors, the bulk of whose money is at stake here um, may get screwed, but those guys managing the funds, those guys making the deals, those guys deciding to put in Chinese companies that, you know, have had no due diligence done on them at all, they're going to make their money. They're going to make their commissions. So this is nothing but gravy as far as they're concerned. Um, Roger, a related question was asked by two of our listeners um, about oversight. Uh, it's Obviously, this whole caper cries out for oversight. Where is the SEC, A? B, um, what about the Congress? And C, is there any kind of real concerted effort being made within even the executive branch to um, monitor this. You mentioned uh, the Committee on the Foreign Investment in the United States as, a, uh, as a, an example of oversight, but it's not really their job, is it? Well, the answer is no, no, and no. Uh, no to the SEC, which has really uh, been malfeasant in my view in this whole regard. I mean, imagine they never even commented on the TSP issue all this 11, 10 or 11 months. You, you, you never heard the SEC chairman make a peep about this. He was on television. He was asked about this kind of thing. Uh, and it, it was a very artful dodge, in my opinion. So we, we have a problem with the SEC. When you don't consider US sanctioned companies 
a risk to share value and corporate reputation. I want to know kind of what planet it, does that work on? Uh, the, the same is true with, again, the preferential treatment being accorded the Chinese, uh, where they don't have to abide by the same laws and rules as their American corporate counterparts. How does that work? Who gave them that? I mean, what president? Was it President Obama? Is there an explanation here? I haven't heard what it is, but I can tell you this, it's an outrage and it's got to stop. And so that's not happening at the SEC. They wrote an anemic non-statement, if you want to take their words, the other day, I mean, it was a couple of weeks ago, signed by the chairman uh, and uh, P PCAOB of all folks. <clears throat> and uh, it was really suggesting that this unacceptable high level of risk is the investor's problem. It was an investor beware document. It was acknowledging almost everything that I've talked about and saying, well, you folks better be careful. Uh, I, we're just going to tell you that this is uh, good luck. Uh, yeah, it's a very high level of risk. But wait a minute. It's their job to remedy that. It's their job to make it an even playing field. It's their job to protect the American investor community. They are not doing their job. It's an outrage. And 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 the As same. You know, Dr. Robinson, interestingly enough, the uh, the uh, SEC's own former chairman. Arthur Levitt and one of his senior staff guys, uh, Michael Mann, wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal just last week, basically making exactly that point. It's it's the SEC's job to be protecting these investors, and it's falling down on that job. So, is Congress uh, doing any better? Well, let, let's let's just let's just relay the title of that SE, uh, that uh, Wall Street Journal editorial. Uh, what was it? The SEC's China evasion. That doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? The fact is that they were taken to task by their own team who just couldn't believe uh, the gaps, who couldn't believe that they were see what they were seeing. That is required reading. So before we go on, did you, uh, the, as far as the Congress is concerned, there have been, I mean, for example, uh, to just today, uh, Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Gene Shaheen, uh, on a bipartisan basis, released a statement. They had put legislation in on TSP. They had written several letters to the TSP board. Uh, other senators have engaged. Uh, but it's uh, as, as laudable as it is, it's episodic. It's, it, it's, it, it's issue-oriented. Uh, Senator Rubio has been the best on this. I'll make no bones about it. He's gone after PCAOB in a big way, and this remarkable uh, discrepancy between what's required of American corporations versus Chinese, et cetera, these ironies. Uh, but it's time for veto-proof legislation. What about U.S. sanctioned companies? What are they doing in the capital markets being invested in and funded uh, as a, what, a reward for having engaged in egregious national security and human rights violations. So Capitol Hill has to look to itself. It just can't rely on a few stars, if you will. It's got to wake up and smell the coffee. And Nancy Pelosi should yeah. care about this. She cares about the, the, the Tibet community to her credit very much. And yet she was just days away from holding Hike Vision and other human rights abusers in her portfolio, not a peep. Uh, and the list goes on. So there's a lot to do there. As far as the executive branch is concerned, <clears throat> there should be there should be a CFIUS equivalent for the capital markets. Our capital markets, just to be clear, have over 60% of the world's liquidity. Our capital markets are larger than the rest of the world's combined. So when somebody tries to hoodwink you and tell you, well, if we don't behave properly in our markets, if we set up too many obstacles and too much of that natty disclosure, they're going to go elsewhere and we'll be sorry. There is no elsewhere. There is nowhere to go. We utterly dominate the economic and financial domain on this planet. Everybody should remember that. China's playing in our sandbox. We invented the international trading and financial system. They're, we're not playing in their sandbox. They don't even have a convertible currency. 
we have the world's reserve currency and the list goes on. So we have to remember where we are in this thing. And all I can say is the, the executive branch is duty bound, particularly now that they have awoken to this problem in all of its dimensions, both fiduciary, national security, and human rights. Those are the three legs of the stool, make no mistake about it. Once you're aware of that, you've got guilty knowledge. It's time to act. And I hope that the president will demand that his own team pivot off of this great victory, frankly, of the TSP debacle coming to a screeching halt at his hands and pull together his economic and security team together and intelligence community to say, that's it. No more abuse, no more disequilibrium, no more preferential treatment, no more bad actors. That's not in the midst of the pandemic that's, that's killed so many of our loved ones, that has destroyed our net worth, that has taken our jobs, that has made us feel like we're in some kind of post-nuclear war environment where we're afraid of the hidden enemy when we go outside. What's up with that? This is the time that we're going to continue to reward, reward China with hundreds of billions and even trillions of dollars more. I think it's time to use a Nancy Reagan statement going back to her anti-drug days and apply it here, which is just say no. Amen. Roger Robinson, I, I think we're going to wrap at this point. Uh, there's a, a wealth of information about all of this, which I really commend to all of you listening. Uh, Roger is uh, one of the featured contributors in the programming of the Committee on the Present Danger China. Its website is presentdangerchina.org. Um, we have been documenting uh, many of the issues that we've touched on today in much greater detail, many of them on videos, including um, several by Roger, uh, by General Boykin, and uh, so many others. Uh, Rob Spaulding's name was mentioned in one of the questions. Uh, he's contributed to our uh, briefings. We have uh, a terrific opportunity now, I think it's fair to say, with the president's decision on the Thrift Savings Board um, gambit to invest, uh, as we've been discussing, in the enemy's enabling companies. To make that case more broadly, to ensure that we desist from doing that kind of, well, to paraphrase Vladimir Lenin's um, claimed statement, financing the purchase of the rope with which the communists will hang us, the capitalists. This must stop, as Roger says, it must stop now. And each of you have an opportunity to play a role in it. Um, one, if you haven't already done so, I commend to you is uh, joining the petition. Uh, I've had some 4,000 people to date sign it to the president, urging him to do what he's done, commending him now for having done it is our next step and calling for the broadening of this lens to address what Wall Street more generally is doing. And let me just close with this final thought. There is an opportunity for those masters of the universe to strengthen our country instead of strengthening our adversaries by investing patriotically, by investing in an American first way, if you will, to ensure that our infrastructure, our intellectual property development, incubating research and development operations, um, our uh, military industrial capabilities are enhanced instead of doing that for our avowed enemies, the Chinese Communist Party. And I hope very much that you'll continue to watch this space. We'll be working it at the Committee on the Present Age of China with great allies and colleagues like uh, General Jerry Boykin and Roger Robinson, uh, and with as many Americans as we can who appreciate this is the moment. 
when we must recognize and resist this generation's existential threat to freedom. And with your help, I know President Trump and the rest of us will do just that.